start recording. All right. So uh, the assignment for today was to play a video game, War Game Red Dragon. Looks like five students in the class did not know oh, so. Hey. Yep. Sorry about that. It's all right. We could hear you burp. That's right. Um, it's a bit odd. You know, we got three, three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen. We have sixteen people in the class, and five of them didn't play a video game. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to tell you. Like this, this is the same thing that happened last semester, which is like a bunch of the class just sort of, I don't know, vanish into thin air. It's hard to say. It's like I, I don't think, I don't know. It's, it's a video game class. Like how could you not do a video game class? It's not like it's calculus. You know? Maybe RTSs aren't your strategy, or, or your they're not your jam. But I don't know. Like yeah, I wasn't good at it. But what I did do was I managed to like I managed to work through it, and I was able to get both Span and Hernandez some time with me to play it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you do PVE or PVP? PVP for both of us, so across mm -hmm. two nights. Not everyone was able on the same night, so 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 yesterday I said it was already done, but I wanted to help Span out of a tight spot if, if he were to get it in one because he he was an initiated doing it last night, so I wanted it to be a good Samaritan in a sense. Good. good, good for you. Yeah, so um, how many of you guys had never played an RTS before, a real-time strategy game before? Anyone? Uh, so you, uh, you, guys yeah, all, you, you guys have all played some sort of real-time strategy game, StarCraft, Age of Empires, mm -hmm. like Stafford, Stafford, you never played one before? So, uh, only the other one is StarCraft, and I'm bad at it. Yeah. So, Lave, what what did you think of uh, Red Dragon? Uh, the tutorial was uh, was all right, but it could have been done. It could have been done better. But uh, the overall, the game was really fun. Like me and okay. the boys and the girl enjoyed our time. Okay. Did you guys and, play PvP yeah. or PVE? Uh, mostly PVE, so we could actually like understand how the game works through that by looking at how the AI position themselves and how they try to attack us. So we learned through that. One of the weird parts was uh, we couldn't uh, figure out how to capture bases properly. Mm. And for the longest time, we were just like, how do we take these? We have troops in the spot. They're not being conquered. But then we we're just like, oh, there's this one dude that just holds the fort for us. We need to actually buy them. Yeah, the command, the command units. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, what's interesting is that you can get a helicopter command unit, uh, oh. so you can, you can fly, you can fly a helicopter. And so, like when I was playing with uh, Pablo and those guys, two two v two, they start off by just sending all of their units south. And so I just had a um, helicopter command unit, and I just flew it around the edge of the map and landed it in their s starting base. You know, and they had nobody left there, so I landed there. I, I dropped some special forces infantry, had them all hide in the trees, anti-air, anti-tank, you know, dug in. And then when they turned around and came back to try to take it, like, I just slaughtered their guys. And I almost was able to drop my second helicopter on their other starting base and take out, oh. which which would have eliminated all of their income, right? Because at the start of the game, you only have your starting base. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I, I got my sneak on the first one. And then uh, they saw that, and then uh, when I tried dropping on the second one, they had spawned new units, and they shot down my, my command helicopter on the <laughs> second one. And so the whole game was basically fought in their base, like, with them trying to reclaim it, you know. And, Back and forth, just getting resources. <laughs> and I was trying to take their other starting base, and then my partner was just kind of effing around on the map doing stuff. And they were pushing in the middle part of the map, but because I had the two uh, command start starting places... Uh, those were the only two starting places that were on the water, and so they couldn't spawn naval units. And oh. so uh, there were there were islands that I could take, and so I just sent a little uh, you know command naval unit over there and took all the naval islands. And then I just had my navy on the on the coastline, and they would just sit there shelling the the shore, and they they couldn't do anything about it, you know. And <laughs> and I, I don't even know if they could spawn aircraft because I think that might have been I don't know I don't know if they cut off the one player's aircraft as well, but it, it was just it was just kind of a fun tactic that you could you could do that um, yeah just sneak around and just take their territories <laughs> yeah yeah okay so uh Dolan, did you play uh did you play red dragon let's see we got an essay you did 
All right. What what was your what was your take on it? How how do you how do you feel? What was good about it? What was bad about it? Stuff with the five to one death to kill ratio. You were the hard carry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Most of our group just played eight against AI, so yeah. we didn't really get the chance to play PvP. Uh, difficult to know how to, hard to see where the units were. Yeah, that, that's a problem. Um, yeah. It's definitely a problem for the game. Um, positioning yeah, I watched a tutorial where, like, the names of the boxes should, wouldn't conflict, and I, I applied it, but it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, one, one thing that I, I... I put paladins and cataphracts in there. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, Age of Empires 2 reference. Uh... Yeah, one, one thing that I do find annoying is the is the supply mechanism. So all the oh, units okay. have an amount of supply, and they can run out of bullets, right? Or run out of rockets or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to have supply units that resupply them and will, will, you know, fix them up and stuff. And so, like, if you have helicopters, uh, they run out of fuel, and so you have to fly your helicopters back. But even if you, like, right-click on the supply base, the helicopters don't land. They just fly there, and then they hover in the air, burning through their fuel until you like remember to go back to your base and click land on each one of your helicopters and have them land next oh, to the supply have to base. do that it's so annoying uh, yeah yeah we just literally just waited for them to like land i think that's what we did yeah they'll run out of fuel and then they'll land and then they'll refuel but you have to manually like there's so much micro like that it's so annoying i was thinking about the chinooks right or the yeah the helicopter refueling units mm -hmm. wait can they refuel while in the air or do no. they have to land you have to land them yeah, you land them, and then the Chinooks will refuel your tanks or whatever. Uh -huh. And then and then you have to fly your Chinook back to your supply base and land Didn't them manually them. and have them re pick up fuel oh. from the base. And then right-click and... Yeah, yeah, just go back and forth. We just bought more Chinooks <laughs> <laughs> and more cargo buses. Mm -hmm. just, that's how we refueled everything. Yeah, but in a long game, like even your supply base can run out of supplies. And then um, you can't resupply any of your units. It's like my naval... Yeah. Like I, I like playing as naval, and so I would ferry uh, resupplies out to my my gunboats, and then which was kind of annoying because you had to find an island or something for your chinook to land on, and then it had a little radius, and so you had to move your ships kind of in the radius, and then they would get yeah. ammunition, and then move them out so you could move other, and it was just so micro intensive. Like yeah, exactly. It's just like that was the intimidating part. <laughs> Back all I had no clue why his tanks were moving. Yeah, yeah, it's. Um, <laughs> And there's no like icon, like out of gas icon or something, right? Oh, there is. Is there? there? Is. Okay. Because yeah. cause, like a lot of times, like you're, you're, uh, uh, like, if, I don't know, like, it's been a while since I played it, but like, if your guys aren't firing, it's like, why are, you know, what's going on here? Yeah, exactly. It's like, they're useless. Let's buy more units. It's mm -hmm. like, no, you just need to refuel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, childhood stuff played AOE for the horses. Nice. <laughs> Tanks are slow. Yes, it has, it, What's interesting is that all the infantry come with um, APCs, right? So, like, every time you buy an infantry unit, it comes with a tank. It's not really a tank, but it's an armored unit, uh, an armored personnel carrier, like a Bradley fighting vehicle. And so uh, when you buy infantry, you also have to buy a vehicle with it. Uh, named after, was it Omar Bradley, the general? Uh, Bradley... Yeah, these things. And so these they look like tanks, right? And they got the reactive armor on them and stuff like that. But they're actually troop carriers. And so on the inside, wow. you, you have a squad of people. And so the APC ferries the infantry to the battlefield. And then you have to unload your infantry, right? Which is also pretty micro-intensive. Um, Wait, you do that in the game as well? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> we had no idea. Yeah, so if you have an infantry unit, you'll just see, like, the APC driving around. But that's not actually your unit. You have to click on them and hit unload. And then the actual squad will appear. Oh, we were just using our cars and <laughs> just shooting from the car. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> and if the car dies, all the infantry dies as well. Yeah. And so uh, you, you unload the infantry. Then the infantry can run into buildings and take cover inside of buildings, which makes mm -hmm. them really hard to get out. Like if you have um, units that specialize in close quarters fighting, close quarters mm -hmm. combat, um, they will wreck people trying to clear them out of the buildings. It's so like if you have the, uh, 
uh, the Sikh unit, the um, the uh, Gurkhas for the Brits. Um, you, you stick them in buildings, and like when in, enemy infantry try to come in and take the buildings, they just wreck them. Yeah, they're just oh, okay. And so uh, the enemy has to sort of identify which buildings your Gurkhas are in, and then call in artillery and just pulverize the buildings, right? And if they start doing that, then you run your guys out into other buildings. And, you know, eventually, I guess they could just pulverize the entire thing. But you can make it really, really tough to, like, clear out um, guys from a control point. So um, it's kind of cool. It's kind of a neat, kind of neat system. Mm. Uh, gun assignment will be due tomorrow. Trying to catch up with the UE4 because I got the school laptop. Cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, so there, there's a lot of elements like that in the game. And there's a lot of micro that I'm not hugely a fan of. But... Um, I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully you guys um, saw something new that might give you ideas when you make your own games, right? Yeah. Um, One of the strange things about the game, though, as well, is that they don't automatically use the roads to um, to go travel through, and we have to choose the uh, fastest, most the, the advanced options to move as fast as we possibly could, because correct. they would always go through the mountains, and I'm just like, no, why are you so slow? Just yep. take the road. <laughs> yep, that to me that is a bizarre game design decision. Like if you right click, it chooses direct path, which is not the fastest path. It'll just go right yeah. through the forest, up a cliff, you know, and you're like, what the hell is Fucking going on? Yeah. You have to choose fast move, <laughs> and then they'll take the roads and stuff like that. And I always forget and right click, and yeah, yeah, that's I, I think that's a really good criticism of the game. <laughs> Stafford, were you gonna say something? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like the game made us some really interesting decisions. Like, of course, sometimes like there were a little bit of instability issues that me and Span experienced at times. A little bit of an instability with the visuals. Like there would sometimes be graphical crashes, even on the recommended settings. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. It, and also there would be tearing. Like so, it was like on mine, I got a crash, but on Span, like it was everything was all proper, but like. Sometimes if you scroll too fast, it would crash. Huh. But even if you didn't, there'd still be tearing at some angles. Huh. Interesting. I, I didn't see that on mine, but it's interesting. Um, yeah, no problem either. Prado, did you play the game? Let's see if you turned in an essay. What game? <laughs> <laughs> right, Prado, I, I unmuted the, the the red the red dragon game that was your homework. Oh, you're, you're in a, 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 IS fifty B. Never mind. Don't worry about it. Okay, <laughs> he's hanging out from the future. He is visiting you from the future. All right. Um, yeah. So you know, I it, it's it. You know, my take on it is I am happy that I played the game and I have no desire to play the game anymore. I kind of wanted to play with you guys yeah. just because I wanted to see you guys kind of discovering things like, oh, the infantry are inside the, <laughs> you know, like I, I kind of wanted to watch that process or, if, you know, how quickly you guys could figure out the supply mechanics and things like that. Cause they're really sort of non-intuitive, you know, and I, it's interesting to me to see how people figure out, you know, things like that. Um, when I ran over a tree, the tree just sunk into the ground, like it was sinking to quicksand. Yeah. And the scouting mechanics are also kind of hard to, to get a grasp on in the game um, as well. Uh, was somebody else going to say something? Okay. Yeah, so yeah. it's it's an interesting take on a real-time strategy game, and, and that's why I signed it as a homework assignment. It's it free. It's part of it. But when I saw that it was free, I'm like, oh, yeah, let's do that one. Because um, the it, it's, it's a different RTS from Age of Empires and StarCraft, which are a lot more traditional. There's no econ, really, to speak of. There's control points, which can spawn units. But you don't have, like, villagers, and you can't... You can't, like, raid their eco. Like, you can seize their bases, but there's no, like, civilian units you really need to watch out for. Um, I played a lot of naval in Red Dragon, which is not the game's strength also, so that might also influence my perspective of the game. But, like, I, I, had, a, I had a lot of fun with, with the naval in it. So, What was that? It also has elements of day of defeat. Mm, I never played that. It's a Valve game. That's based on a World War II, mm -hmm. and it's more realistic than other Valve FPSs at the time. Okay. Oh, it's an FPS. Yeah, the ADP is an FPS, and it's often underlooked, but it, it, it did it was revolutionary for its time because it came right after Half Life Two, and it was mm -hmm. well, that's what the Source version, but the Gold Source version came right after the original Half Life, so mm -hmm. it was crazy. 
Oh, so it was before Medal of Honor. Ooh, Medal of Honor's been out for that. a while. Yeah. Yeah, the Medal of Honor series has been out for a long time. Yeah. The real Medal of Honor. Come on. Video game. <laughs> no, not the video game. Uh, video game series. 1999, yeah. yeah, it's, been, yeah it's, been out for, it's been out for a long time. So, okay. So, yeah, free, uh, Surviving Mars is now is now the uh, the game you can play. I don't know if you guys want to do that one. <laughs> it's just your homework for the, this class is just playing whatever's free on Epic Game Store at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a... Uh, I haven't played St Surviving Mars. I think I own it on Steam. I own it now in the Epic Game Store. But um, a fun game to review for extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Okay. So there's... Uh, so yeah, I hope that was interesting for you guys because I, I really want you to develop your um, your game analysis brain. Like, it's when you play a game and something annoys you, it just... Make a mental note like, I don't like that, you know? Like, the, the supply system, like, I like the, the supply system in concept, right? I like the idea that you can just run out of bullets. And if you have guys over there hiding in a, in a, in a building, which I would do, like, I would sneak. So I, I like playing with special forces, British spe special forces. They can just run out of bullets, you know? Like, I like, I like that idea. It's a cool idea. But the fact that you have to fly a Chinook over there, and then, like, even if you right-click on the the Gurkhas, like it won't supply them. Like you have to land, you know, and, and when your helicopter's in the air, the AI will just send a plane over and blow it out of the sky. So if you, if you look away for a second, it, it dies, you know, and that, that level of micro intensity, I don't like, I have, I have similar uh, criticisms in Age of Empires 2. There's, there's a couple things that are micro intensive in uh, Age of Empires 2, which is siege, or is it spelled like this? Siege, it's spelled like that. Um, and monks, right? So monks and siege both require an intense amount of micro. And if you if you scroll away to like go to your eco and you come back, the enemy siege will have plastered your entire army because it's it's so micro intensive. What was that? Has anyone played Age Age Two? Age of Empires Two. And they've, they've done a lot of things in recent years to reduce the micro. Like it used to be you'd build a farm and then a few minutes later the farm would disappear and you'd have, you'd have to go back and rebuild it over and over again. And uh, so then they added queuing farms so that you could have them replant a farm. Uh, but then you'd still have to remember to queue farms. And so they finally just added in like the uh, auto rebuild farms option which reduced the amount of micro because you'd be over like microing your army and then your economy would collapse because all the farms would go away and your guys would just be standing there. Right. Age of Kings, uh, yeah, the the original. Um, and then they've added cues and stuff like that. And I'm gonna go ahead and mute you guys. Yep. Um it's a siege requires a lot of micro and monks require a lot of micro too. Um you can right click to convert a unit. Um, but you have to click on each unit. So if you have like five monks in a group, uh, if you don't have the right technology for it, you have to click on a monk and then you have to click on an enemy unit and then click on a monk and click on a different enemy unit and then click on a monk and click on a different enemy unit and click on a monk and click on a different enemy and, and the battlefield just has like all these people running around like this, you know? And then if you have the right technology, then at least you can select all of your monks and right click, but then you have to sit there and wait for it to convert and then click on the next one and wait for it to convert and in the meantime, your monks have died, right? Um, you can't order your monks to just convert enemies. Um, and so I don't play with monks because it's just too annoying uh, to, to, to deal with most of the time. Um, if they're going with like elephants or really big units, I might build a couple monks and you know convert those. But like if you have thirty monks, like forget about it. Like I'm not I'm not gonna. Yeah. It's too it's too annoying to deal with. Okay, so uh, let's uh, let's talk about a little more linear algebra. There is one more linear algebra thing we need to learn, and that is matrix times matrix. So if, uh, so if you know how to do matrix times vector, you know how to do ma matrix times vector. So if you have a, uh, to do a, a matrix times matrix, you do matrix times vector on each column. That's, what does that mean? Okay, let's do an example. 
So three five zero 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 seven ten. So this is oh, that should be one. Uh, this is a transformation matrix that is going to scale and translate. Okay. So it's going to scale it non-uniformly. It's going to scale more in the x direction than the y direction. You know, let's make it uniform, I guess. Make it a little more sensible. So it'll scale three times in the x direction, three times in the y direction. Then it will translate seven in the x direction and ten in the y direction. So to recap, how we would um, ten twenty. So if you have an input point, this is the x, this is the y. Um, so in a Cartesian coordinate system, we'd have x is 10, y is 20. So what this code is going to do, it's going to scale it times 3 in the uh, direction it's facing. So it scales it times 3 from the origin. So it'll become uh, 30, 60, 30 across, 60 up. And then it's going to translate it 7 in the x direction and 10 in the y direction. So it's going to end up at 37, uh, 70 as the final um, result. And so we can run through the math on this. So 3770 should be the answer. I'll just try this up here and see if I can do it. 3770. See if my ma mental math is correct. So we take 10, 20, and 1. We turn it sideways. This is just a recap of last time. We multiply down. So we multiply 10 times each of these numbers in here. Multiply 20 times each of the numbers in here. We multiply 1 times each of the numbers in here. And then we add across. So we get 30. And so we multiply down, and then we add all the numbers across each row. So we get 30 plus 7. Uh, 20 times 3 is 60 plus 10. And 0, 0, 1. And so the final the final answer is going to be thirty seven seventy one. So good. So you guys remember that from last time. Multiply down, add across. It's the hardest thing you'll do in this class. Do you guys all remember that? People on Discord. Essentially, okay. I'll put up a, I'll put up a quiz for you guys to do that. Um, when you do a matrix multiplication, you just do that on each of the columns. Uh, so what does that mean? So let's say we've got... a matrix that looks like this, 1021. Let's do 1021 again, why not? And uh, 3, 5, 1. So let's say we do this. So what you do is you take the first column and you do the... You do the vector times matrix thing, and you write the result into the matrix <clears throat> that's going to be the output. So the first column will be 3771. You then take the next column, turn it sideways, multiply down, add across, and you put the results of that into the second column in the resulting matrix, 37, 70, and 1. And then you take the third column, 351, Three, five, one. Multiply down. Add across. Three times three is nine. Plus seven is sixteen. Five times three is fifteen. Plus ten is twenty-five, and one. And that is matrix multiplication. So when you multiply a vector times a matrix, let's do it the other way. Matrix times a vector, you get a vector. If you multiply a matrix times a matrix, you get a matrix. Matrix times a scalar, you get a matrix. Vector times a scalar, you get a vector. Scalar times a scalar, you get a scalar. Vector times a vector, you either get a scalar or a vector, depending on if you're doing cross product or, or inner product. It sounds simpler than the matrix times vector. Yeah, there's, there's one... Yeah, you're you're doing you're doing matrix times vector three times. You're just doing it for each column, and so you take the first column, and the result of that goes into the first column of the output, and then you do the second column, and the the answer from that goes into the second column's output, and then you do the third column, and the output of that goes into the third column's output. So that's it. So matrix times matrix is just matrix times vector on each column, and the result goes into the corresponding column. So. Um, okay, let's do let's do an example. 
Uh, let's do a complicated one, I guess. Three, five, four, one, six, three, negative 10, 15, two. So this isn't like a transformation matrix. I'm just doing a normal matrix times um, five, 10, zero, seven, six, three, negative one, five, seven. Okay, so uh, this is gonna involve a lot of multiplies and a lot of adds, right? So, um, who wants to go first? Collins, why don't you go first? Thanks for volunteering. So Collins, uh, take the, figure out what the answer should be for the first column. So we're gonna get a three by three matrix as the result. The answers are gonna go in here. <clears throat> so compute that for me. Collins, you take the five, you take the 10, you take the zero. Collins is not answering. Okay, so it's gonna become five times three, five times one, five times negative 10, 10 times five, zero times, oh, these are all gonna be zeros, huh? Zero times, zero times. Collins has left the chat. Uh, trying to math, okay, got lost during the explanation. So uh, five times three, so what you do, to do a vector times a matrix, you take the vector, turn it sideways, you see five, 10, zero, five, 10, zero. Turn it sideways, you multiply down, then you add across. So uh, five times three, five times one, five times negative 10, 10 times five, 10 times six, 10 times 15, and then these are all gonna be zeros, right? And then you add the results across. <clears throat> so we end up with 15 plus 50, that's a zero, 15 plus 50 is 65. Five plus 60 is also 65, it's a coincidence. And negative 50 plus 150 is 100. Okay. Thank you, Collins. Uh, let's go with Dolan for the second column. Okay, so the second column is gonna be seven, six, three. So you're gonna take this, turn it sideways, seven, six, three. Like David Copperfield here, just making things disappear. I saw him in concert last February, right before the coronavirus shut down. That was kind of cool. <clears throat> I was in the front row and I, I could not see um, how he did any of his tricks. Like he made these giant dinosaurs appear and stuff like that. I'm like, I'm like this far away, you know, I, I don't know, I couldn't see anything. Penn and Teller actually went up on stage for Penn and Teller. My daughter was like into magic about a year ago. So we took her to see David Copperfield and Penn and Teller. So, um, yeah, Penn and Teller, she was in, but my daughter was up on stage and I went with her. And so she was like one of the, the volunteers up on stage, which is pretty cool. And then she discovered that doing magic was actually really hard and she lost interest in it. <laughs> so we got 60, 63 for the first one. Okay, so we got seven times three plus six times five plus three times four. So it's 21, 30, 51, 51 plus 12 uh, is 63. Yeah, very good. Very good, very good, very good. 63 for the first one. And then for the second number, we get seven times one plus six times six plus three times three. What do you got? What do you got for the the second one, Dolan? You got the first one, right? That's cool. So fifty-two. So seven plus thirty-six is seven, uh, forty-three. Uh, forty-three plus nine is fifty-two. Very good. Fifty-two is correct. And then uh, the third column. Seven times negative ten. Six times fifteen <laughs> plus. Three times two. Uh, so it's negative 70 plus 90 is uh, 20. 20 plus 12 is 32, right? Am I doing that right? Negative 70, positive 90, 
is 20. 20 plus 12 should be 32 if I'm doing the math right. And uh, you can always do a matrix multiply calculator. Twenty six for the last one. Did I do it wrong? Negative uh, seventy, sixty, ninety is twenty. Twenty plus twelve is thirty two. Right? What what I do wrong? Ah, <laughs> three times two. Thank you. <laughs> I jumped ahead of myself. Three times two is six. <laughs> Very good. Very good. And so I just wrote. I was skipping ahead, and I wrote six down. Very good. Very good. Twenty six. All right. And so you can always uh, you can always do a matrix multiplication calculator, and three times three set the matrices, and then just punch the numbers in. Uh, three one. Let's see, where's a good way of putting this split screen? Okay, so three, uh, four. No, it's three five. Three five four one six three negative negative ten fifteen and two and then the other matrix is uh, five seven negative one ten six five zero three seven calculate and yep there we go sixty five sixty five. 163, 52, 26. Okay. So that is matrix multiplication. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, how does this work for larger matrices? Same thing. Uh, you take the vector. If it's a 10 by 10, you take the left column, turn it sideways, multiply it down, add across, you get a 10 by 1 vector. Take the next column, multiply it down, add across, that's the next column. And there's different ways that people will explain that. Um, but in general, the explanations to me look a little bit scary. I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, they, it looks like this, right? So I, this may be helpful for you, for me. I kind of my brain goes a little bit cross-eyed when I when I see things like that. So I, I like more concrete kinds of things. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is the answer. This is the formal way of defining it. You know, so you take the top left element of the first matrix and multiply it times the top left element of the second matrix, uh, going down the top row and the left column, adding them all together. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. My my brain doesn't work that way, at least. So, when I when I've explained this before, like I've had students tell me this isn't how they learned it in linear algebra, and that's that's fair enough. But I did get an I did get an A in linear algebra. It was actually my favorite math class in college. So, um, probably I internalized it and sort of reprocessed it in a way that made sense to me, and then that's what I share with you. And so, what do you use matrix multiplication for? Well, if you want to composite multiple uh, transformations together, you can do matrix multiplication, and that will create, um, rather than having 10 different transformations, translate five right and up, translate five right and up, translate, you just composite them to make one matrix that is translate 15 and three up, right? That's the main use. You're not actually going to see matrices very often in the Unreal Engine directly. Like this is actually a matrix, right? When you when you look down here and you can see there's location, rotation, and scale, that's actually a transformation matrix. It's just it's pulling the values out and displaying it in human readable format. But you you don't usually work with those uh, directly. If you're writing a game engine, you have to know about them. Uh, when you're using a game engine, it's mostly um, vectors that you have to worry about, and so and kind of understanding what's going on behind the scenes with translation, rotation, and scale. So, um, yeah, all right. So let's fire up Unreal Engine and let's continue our exploration of making interactive environments. So last time we talked about how you can make a trace line weapon. 
So we made basically a hit scan weapon last time. And so we can come in here and... Crash the engine. <laughs> Apparently. Uh, what just happened there? Turned off. I, th I think I might have clicked on the... Uh, the video screen in OBS. Okay. Let's get out of that. Okay. So last time we made a hit scan weapon. And uh, we could also make a projectile weapon. Uh, in fact, the first person the first person template comes with a projectile weapon, right? When when you um, when you start the first person template, it you know, and when you click it, it makes a ball, right? And so that's why I did not delete that code out of there. Uh, it's, I just moved it. No, I did delete it. Damn it. Oh, but, uh, yeah, you can see it spawns, it spawns a new, uh, uh, it spawns a new, um, actor and, um, spawn actor from class. So zoom in here so you guys can see this. So what kind of class we're going to spawn? Uh, now let's do the ball, first person projectile, I think it's called. First person projectile, yeah. So let's spawn a ball and the spawn transform. Okay, so what is a spawn transform? Well, uh, now that you know what the, uh, um, about linear algebra, guess what? It's a, it's a matrix, right? Uh, but it doesn't appear as a matrix. Like I said, you don't usually work with those. Uh, someone's unmuted. Uh, Dolan. Back to the mute farm. Um, so you don't work with the matrices directly like that. Instead, in Unreal Engine, you have the transform uh, split into location, rotation, and scale. And so, um, I don't know if you saw what I did there, but I, I um, uh, a transform is a data type that's basically a matrix, but it, you don't, like, like I said, you don't work with the matrix directly. Um, but you can right click on it and split it, and then you can set the location, the rotation, and the scale all separately from each other. So um, the I'm gonna spawn a ball at the hit location, and uh, I don't care about the rotation, the default scale is fine. Um, I will try to find the nearest open spot to it to spawn at. And I could set myself as the owner, which is useful when you make a projectile because you need to know who the owner is to give credit for a kill, right? If you create a rocket and it kills somebody, you need to give a point to the person who killed the person. And so it's, it's a really good idea to set the owner to be uh, yourself. So uh, drag that in. So we can be the owner. We're, we're not using that right now, so I'm not going to worry about it. But uh, yeah, I can make it. Maybe make the ball a little bigger. Two, 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 and uh, there we go. So let's save this. Come down here and play it. <laughs> so what's happening is the ball is spawning and then immediately it removing itself, right? Because the first person projectile, when it touches something, it goes away. And so it's actually not drawing, right? Oh, that one, that one worked, right? And it's double, double the, uh, the normal size. So what's happening is that if it contacts anything that has physics on it, then it removes itself immediately. And so all you see is the, uh, is the gun knocking the, the thing around. But because the ball doesn't have any velocity, it actually has a velocity of zero, uh, the physics engine doesn't really know how to treat it, right? Because the ball kind of gets moved outwards, and so it's sort of randomly knocking things around. So the first person projectile here is, um, if it hits somebody, it gets the velocity of itself, multiplies by 100, adds impulse, that's physics. So it adds a kick, a physics kick, to the uh, thing and then it removes itself. And that's what's going on there. So typically though, when you do a, um, a projectile, you don't spawn it with hit scan, right? You either use hit scan or you use 
uh, a projectile. You, you usually don't do both. And so this is not exactly what I would want. In fact, it's not what I'd want. Spawning a, a hit scan thing at a location is weird, right? Normally you want it to come out of your gun, right? And so what I would do is actually drag out sphere. Remember, uh, sphere is the tip of the gun right there. So I'm going to drag that out and I'm going to get the location of it. Get world location. So I'm going to get, so I'm, I'm going to make a, a weapon that's both hit scan and projectile. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, get the location of the tip of the gun and I'm going to spawn it there. And I don't have any velocity on it, right? So, um, you know, it's probably not going to do anything. Uh, I might also have to kick it out in front of me a little bit um, so that it doesn't spawn on top of me. Play. See how it's always coming out sideways? It's, it's spawning on top of me. And then... It, then the physics engine tries moving it out of the way and then it will move in that direction right so it's it, it's this is not this is not a good um system just yet so uh we probably want to move it a little bit ahead of us so let's add a little bit of our forward vector so we will get the forward vector Uh, over here and we will do an add let's see that's yeah I'll just do it again so I don't have to pull it all, all the way over that way uh, I will get the forward vector I'm gonna get the direction we're looking and so I want the ball to appear a little bit ahead of us Right, so because right now it's spawning on top of us, and then the physics engine's like, "Oh, it's on top of us. Find a spot that I can put it." And then it's like, "Oh, it moved that far in a frame. It's got a huge velocity in that direction." And then it flies off in some random direction, which is not what we want. So I'm going to get the forward vector, and I'm going to multiply it times 100. Uh, multiply it. Multiply it times 100, and that will spawn it a meter in front of the uh, gun. I can probably uh, modify that later uh, and then I'm going to add that to the world location vector plus vector so do you guys do you guys understand what I'm doing here so right now uh, the right now the ball is spawning at our at the very tip of our gun and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the spawn location ahead of us by a meter so how do you get spawn actor first person projectile uh, it's not called spawn actor first person projectile. Uh, just right click and choose spawn. And then it's going to be spawn actor from class. And then the name of the thing changes when um, you pick the class. So I'm going to add the uh, tip of the spear, tip of the gun, with a meter in the direction we're looking. And that will be the direction it will come out. Save. And uh, yeah, thanks for asking the questions, by the way. Like, I, I don't like when students just sit there quietly, you know, just not say anything. Ooh. Play. So the velocity is not being set on the ball, I think. All right, so let's set the velocity of the ball. So when you spawn something, it returns the ball. And so let's set the, let's set the velocity on it. Okay, set velocity in local space now. Set the world velocity, projectile movement. Hmm. Set physics linear velocity. Set all physics. Set all motors. Not you. Let's see if this will work. Let's 
try that. Let's see if that works. The, the physics engine is still uh, overriding that and uh, and causing the ball to come out at a, at a weird angle. Um, doesn't really matter. We don't. We we already have an example of how to do that in the first person template. So uh, you can always you can always look at that at how to spawn something. Um, the uh, hit scan though is pretty cool. And what I wanted to show you guys today is another way of interacting with the world. So, uh, and I guess, yeah, I guess I'll create here. Let's see if I'll, yeah. So yeah, so the, 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 the two main ways that you have weapons in a, in a game is you either have a hit scan weapon that hits immediately or you have a, um, or you have a, uh, a projectile weapon that creates a projectile and then uh, proceeds to interact with the world. And the way that things interact with the world is by touching and thinking, right? So library, let's see if I have another one in here. Fall 2020. Yeah, sure. I, I wasn't going to go over this again, but um, I think I think this is actually kind of cool. So let's see. Let me show you what I did last semester. Um, any second now when it loads. There we go. So, if you hold down the button and release, it makes a bigger projectile. So this is a charged weapon. Do you hear the Do you hear the sound? So if you click quickly, it makes a small ball. If you hold it down, I don't know if you can hear that. It plays like this plasma charging sound. change my streaming then for you guys it's uh, something that I did last semester let's see back the sound doesn't channel very well um, Unreal Engine there we go go live all right here uh, play it can you guys hear it now So these are some of the dynamic materials I made last time where you can adjust the blood splatter and the dirt and stuff like that. <clears throat> Over here we got a sentry gun. Thank you, thank you guys. <coughs> so here we got a sentry gun, the thing's rotating uh, around looking for humans. And if it finds it, you can see how it keeps rotating towards me. Firing. And then if it loses me, um, if it loses me, then it will go back to its patrol pattern. Like that. Okay. So um, a couple different things there that um, move into the goal. Yeah. So I made a little. Uh, you see how this thing is rotating left and right, so it goes back and forth. So is there any of those things that interest you guys in learning how to do a charged weapon, a sentry gun, um, having a, I, I guess, rocket league type um, thing there where you can run up with your vehicle and knock it into a, a goal? <clears throat> Better than cyberpunk already. I took the projectile code and made it so it spawn fire when you release. Yeah. And so what I did was um, for, for that, I took the first person character. I said rather than recreating that whole thing from scratch, <clears throat> uh, input action fire, montage play, spawn actor first person projectile, uh, place and location, location, rotation, 
yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, so what happens is when I press, yeah, so I, I have two different um, input action fires, one that takes place on the down click and one that takes place on the release click. Okay, so that's that's how you do a charged weapon, right? You have separate events, essentially. I could have, I could have done it like this as well. I could have made it uh, like that instead, or you just have a separate branch for the press and release, but it looks kind of weird. So I just did two separate things. It works fine. So what happens? Uh, screen's not visible. Ooh. Uh, all right. Uh, da, 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 da. Change windows. Screen two. Okay. So uh, so what I what I just said was you could just have one branch coming off for when you press fire and one branch coming off when you press release. So this could be hooked up like that over there if I wanted and I could disconnect this one, but it, I don't know. It just, I, I don't like spaghetti. And so I just had two separate events for input action fire. So when you click for the first time, it will uh, get the current game time and save it into a variable. So there is a variable here called time pressed. And so it just sets the current time. So when you click, it writes down into a variable the current time and starts playing that uh, charge sound. Um, so if you remember, there's websites that have free sounds on them. So I just went on there until I found a good, you know, charging laser plasma sound, like out of Halo or Marathon or one of those games. Or they have the little, you know, the plasma pistol. And then, um, and then I also save the sound so I can turn it off. So I've, I've got a I've got a variable called a charge sound, and um, uh, that that gets set. And um, uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to use that to stop the audio here. Okay. So I grab charge sound that variable, and I there's an audio stop. So this the sound will play for as long as I'm holding down the click button. So it's going to spawn a sound, and then I save that actor. Essentially, it's a audio component reference object, but it doesn't matter. It's blue. It's an actor of some sort. And so the um, thing takes in an audio component object reference. So I save that variable, and then I feed it to stop, and that turns it off. Okay. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. And uh, when I release the button, uh, I also check to see if the sound is playing currently. Uh, the reason why I do that is because you don't want to stop playing an audio that doesn't exist. And so if, if you get into a weird situation where you somehow get a released event without a pressed event, um, then uh, bad things will happen. So basically I just check to make sure that it's um, playing. If it is playing, I stop playing. Uh, and then either way, uh, we go into the montage. You got to have a montage. And so the montage is an animation. So it's going to play a animation, animation montage. Open that up. First person fire montage. Let's get to here. First person animation. First person fire montage. There you go. And so that's that's the animation for firing the gun. That's what animates the gun. And so uh, it just plays a montage, <clears throat> which takes uh, you know not very much time. You can see how quickly it plays, and close out of that. And so what the montage does, it'll play the animation. And so it's targeting uh, my mesh 2P, which is uh, me, right? If you if you remember the the player in, in the first person template doesn't exist. The player is just a pair of arms, right? And so it's a skeletal mesh. That's what the SK stands for. It's a skeletal mesh. And so skeletal mesh has bones. And so what you can do is you can save sequences of animations that animate the bones and uh, in this case, the uh, firing montage is here. And it plays the animation that causes the bones of the arm to go like this briefly. And then um, you can speed it up or slow it down. And when you, and then it'll, re it'll stop any of the other ones on you. And then when it finishes, uh, it will 
uh, and then it, uh, it will spawn the first person projectile and uh, I don't know is that after it finishes or not I don't know uh, and then it will do the spawn that we talked about it spawns the first person projectile uh, the transform is the matrix that it starts with and uh, plays the sound plays the firing sound and then that transform there can be made using make transform if you don't want to do it that way you can split it like I did and have a separate location rotation and scale and so the scale the reason why it gets bigger is because I'm getting the current game time so the current game time minus the last time that I pressed the mouse button is the duration I held it down do you guys understand so the current time minus the time that I clicked is how long I held the button down for and then um, it I have some scale value in here that's one okay so that's just one 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 and so it scales it up based on how long I've held the mouse button down so if I click really fast the thing's almost invisible and if I uh, hold it down for 10 seconds then it, then the ball will be 10 times bigger than normal and so I feed that into make transform here and yeah so and then that that makes the location rotation and scale and that's where the ball comes from okay engine crashes aren't fun yeah 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 you got you got to be careful with some of those things you find out about them when they crash you know you, uh, yeah, you should probably check for that um there's some controller stuff going on here i think we talked about this last time um but I, I guess I can go into more detail on it now. <clears throat> so there's different inputs to a, um, to, okay, so, hmm, terminology, Unreal Engine terminology, all right? So anything that can appear in the world is called an actor, right? Any Anything you drop in the world is an actor. And then you can have uh, pawns, which are moved by controllers, and, um, I don't know if I want to save this. I don't think I want to save it. Um, but basically, the controller for the first-person blueprint. Um, this is you can't just like set the velocity on it or change the position because the controller is literally moving the pawn around. Yeah. Uh, I forgot their name, but they're those big giant towering storm clouds outside right now. Well, that's Stratocumulus. It's cool. Go take a photo. Take a photo for me, please. So I, only, I only got half an hour left in class, and I got so some stuff to get through. So um, when you make a controller, um, you can set up inputs. And so in this case, we've got input axis turn, input axis look up, input action jump, and um, and so you can't. It, 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 a lot of people try doing this in Unreal Engine. Like you try to make a jump pad. It's like you run over a thing, and it. And it you want it to kick the player up into the air and it just doesn't work and the reason why it doesn't work is because there is a controller that is literally overriding the position and rotation of the player every frame and so you have to go through the controller to um, move players and stuff like that it's it's not the same as like with the sentry gun the sentry gun uh let's go over here into bill go into the sentry gun ew so the sentry gun here is uh uh, there's a lot of stuff in that. Okay, uh, so every tick, <clears throat> every tick, it checks to see if they are within 20 meters. So max range, get the world location of the player, player one. We get their location, we subtract our position from their position. If the vector length of that is less than uh, 2,000, which is max range, 2,000. Uh, then, uh, then we move on. Otherwise, we play the idle, play the idle animation. Okay, so this is um, a function that I've created here. So the idle animation is what uh, causes it to rotate left and right. And so I've got a uh, a turn direction, and what happens is when you hit the edge, when you hit your max turn in one direction. It flips the direction to negative one and then it turns in the other direction and it keeps doing that until it hits the negative maximum direction then it flips around and turns to the right again and so this just adds a little idle animation to the um, to the uh, century so the whole the whole net result of this is that it just sets the rotation to be um, something 
and so that caused it to just swing back and forth like that. Um, I didn't get good photos because I think the wind blew away the trial cumulus already, yeah. but uh, and also because I couldn't see the screen of where That's I was pretty. pointing. Pretty. So there's this, nice this, girl. this, this. Very nice, very nice. I know, so I didn't get a good picture of this. Um, and so then the sentry gun does a dot product. Do you guys remember dot product? So we get our forward vector, we get the displacement vector of the player to us, we normalize the displacement vector, and then we take the dot product of the direction we're looking and the displacement vector, this is what we've talked about a few times now, dot product it. If they are within a 45 degree arc in front of us, then cool, if not, uh, we can't see them, and then it plays the idle animation. Um, and then if they are within 45 degrees of us, look, it's what we talked about last time, trace line. And so the reason why I've been kind of introducing you guys to all of these linear algebra components is because you use them all, right? So to make a sentry gun, I've got a, a vector length. This is what we first started talking about. I got a dot product to see if they're in front of us. And then I do a line trace to see if there is a clear line of sight between us, our location right here, and them, their location. And if there is a open spot, uh, then um, we proceed, otherwise we don't. And so what we do is um, the thing is going to return the, uh, the actor in the world that the line hit, and only if it's the player really do we care. Um, otherwise, if it's a wall or something like that, we don't care. And so if it's anything but a static mesh, mesh actor, whatever that is, um, then it goes back to idle animation. If it can see us, and there's a clear line of sight between the sentry gun and the player, then it will start rotating towards the player. So that uh, will rotate the sentry gun to face towards the player. And so, um, yeah. And so the, where does it try to rotate to? This position here. So basically, if you want to rotate an object in the world to face something, there's a function for that. So I'm here, there's a position over here, rotate towards it, okay. And if you want it to not spin immediately to it, there's uh, commands to yaw towards something. So you can rotate slowly over time towards towards something as well. And then uh, we check to see if it's been at least half a second since the last time we fired. We get the current time. We get the last time we fired, subtract them. And if the time is uh, bigger than half a second, then we move on. And then we finally shoot them and play the, the gun sound and do damage to them is currently removed and so yeah and so it is going to uh, get the location of the player and play the explosion sound at their at their position and that is a sentry gun okay kind of cool a lot of wires on the screen but like when you work through it and that's why that's why I commented this right I commented this so that you can see, you know, step by step. Can can we see them? Can are they within range? Are they in front of us? Do we have a clear line of sight? Has it been more than half a second? Cool. Shoot. Okay. So these are these are each of the tools that we've talked about this this semester, and that's uh, kind of hard to get used to. It's kind of see cool to see how the math is applied, but it's hard to see how it, it's hard to get used to. Yeah, you, you just got to do it. That's why I'm having you guys like do these little things where you're, you're just recreating what I'm doing because, um, you know, you can't go wrong that way, right? And uh, have some fun with it, mess with it, you know, but that's that's what you learn by, by doing. And, and so we're going to get into modding in a little bit, maybe starting next week. And modding is a great way of learning because you start with a product that already exists and then you tweak it and see if your tweaks work, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that's a sentry gun. Um, and I just use the default model. Okay, so for the for the input on a player, where does that come from? Where do, where do all these things come from? Well, uh, if you go into ed edit project settings, edit project settings, which seems like, why does that matter? It matters a lot. Project settings actually um, controls a lot of things that really matter. Um, and there's a lot of 
options. There's a lot of options in Unreal Engine. And if you set something wrong, then everything breaks, you know. Uh, so, uh, description, fall 2020 demo project, whatever, okay. So under input, so I went to project edit, project settings, input. You can see that the first person template has set up some inputs for you by default. So things like jump, fire, zoom out, and then under axis mappings, you should see move forward, move right, turn right, all those things. Those are, if you ever wondered where like key bindings come from and stuff like that, this is kind of like your starting, your starting, um, thing here. And so you see, I've actually created a new thing called zoom out. And so if I hit the Z key, uh, it should, I don't know if that's still operational. There you go. So you see that? I, I added a custom key bind. All right, dude, all right, all right, chill. Right, and so the zoom out key just moves the camera backwards away from the player. back into the project settings input so you, you can add custom keybinds and so you, so by default uh, the the first person template makes move forward bound to W and move forward bound to s wait what wait move forward is bound to s mm-hmm the reason for that is because s has a scale of negative one so there are two different kinds of inputs you can have in a video game or at least in this video game uh, action mappings which are simple key presses like Z and then there's axis mappings, which are things that can range from positive one to negative one. So if you're thinking about like a thumbstick on a controller, that would be an axis mapping. Whereas an action mapping would be like the X button, right? It's either hit or it's not hit. Whereas an axis mapping, it could be 0.5, negative 0.5, something like that. And so W is set to be positive one and S is set to be negative one. And up arrow, down arrow is set to be positive one, negative one. The, uh, uh, Oculus Touch thumbstick, whatever, we don't need any of those. <clears throat> but um, uh, the, the gamepad left thumbstick is controls forward and backwards, and turn right is bound to A and D. A is turn left because it's negative one. D is turn right, or move right, sorry. And then the X axis on the left thumbstick slides you left and right. And then for turning, uh, left arrow, right arrow, or the gamepad right thumbstick or uh, mouse X. <clears throat> so X, the X mouse axis controls your left and right. And if you want to look up, that is the Y axis. And the reason why it's negative one on the Y axis is because uh, in screen coordinates, uh, in screen coordinates, yeah, 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 whatever, my camera is mirrored. Um, in screen coordinates, the top left part of the screen is zero, zero. So there's rows and there's columns and rows go downwards and columns go rightwards. So columns are X and Y is rows. And so Y zero is the top left corner. Zero zero is the top left corner of the screen. So as Y increases, you're going down the screen. And so by default, uh, the Y mouse is set to be negative so that when you move the mouse up, it moves up on the screen, right? You go from 10 to five, that's up. Right, but if you want to invert your, your Y mouse, um, then you set that to one. <clears throat> and then when you play it, now when I move the mouse down, it looks up. And when I look move the mouse up, it looks down. So this is um, inverted mouse axis, that mouse Y axis. This is a fairly common setting that you should support because uh, idiot people like me use it. Um, I played a lot of um, flight simulators when I was a kid. And so I just got used to moving the mouse backwards, tilting the nose of the plane up. So I play all first person shooters with my Y axis inverted, <clears throat> only to get mocked by it by Rock Band. <laughs> Rock Band has a t-shirt that says, I invert my Y axis as a warning to people that you're not human. That's what it says in the game. So, um, and then we got action mappings here. Jump is set to be space or uh, gamepad face button bottom, that would be the X button on the PlayStation. 
fire is set to be mouse zero or mouse left mouse button <clears throat> zoom out is set to be z and i and you can just make these right you can just make a new action like if you want to have a you know use button you just click on the little plus here and you say i'm going to make a uh, use action use whatever like that and i want to bind that to the e key type e and then it's going to find a lot of things but under the key board there's the e key and that's it that's how you set up your key bindings kind of cool right so um to come back into first person blueprints or blueprints under first person character uh, you can see that input axis turn is an axis thing so this actually takes a value from negative one to positive one and so all it does is it passes that on to add controller yaw input and for looking up and down it passes on the value there to add controller pitch input so this <clears throat> this uh connects to the controller which is down here i believe and um uh yeah and that and that sets different different things and somewhere inside of there it, it moves the camera like the controller is where is the camera use pawn, yeah there it is right there so use pawn uh control so basically um the controller is rotating the pawn around and so the camera picks up the the pitch and the 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 roll or not the roll the pitch and the yaw from the uh from the controller and then the camera moves appropriately so that's that's kind of like behind the scenes it's all done for you by default when you make a first person template um <clears throat> and then uh stick input we don't care about head mounted display we don't care about so i could delete all that if i wanted but let's show you how to add a new key bind okay so the new key bind would be called uh i call it action use action use yeah and so look that that key bind that i created that's bound to e by default i could just actually create um, an input for like uh, spacebar. Like, there's actually a whole section for keyboard events where you can actually just be like, if they hit the E key, do something. But it's it's usually better to do it this way because then you can like allow people to rebind their keys and stuff like that, which is usually a good idea. People don't like it when you force them to use your key settings. Um, but you could just do it this way if you wanted. So when they hit press, when they press the spacebar, we'll just print string. Uh, space bar press and uh, string. I always start these things by just making sure they work. Use key press, <clears throat> and so you can either just have events just that are directly like when they click the mouse button. Uh, in general, though, I would go through the edit. Again, it's under edit, project settings, input, and set up key binds and things like that. So if we compile that and run it. Nope, that was maximize, not minimize. There we go. Play. I hit the E key. Use key pressed. Use key pressed. Hit space. Space bar pressed. Space bar pressed. You can see that gravity is actually lower than normal. I think I changed the, uh, the gravity in the world too. Okay. So that's how you set up key binds. And, um, um, where does, where does all this stuff begin? That's actually a good question too. So under settings, under world settings, uh, you can see over here on the right hand side, let's undock it and maximize. Um, you can see under world settings, uh, pre-compute visibility is actually probably a good idea to do, but whatever. Um, you can set the game mode. The game mode has all of the base settings for the game in it. So world settings chooses um, the game mode, and then that will set like where the you know who the first person is and things like that. Uh, gravity, huh? Interesting. So it must be under the the player. Then they might have gravity reduce on them. Uh, world to meters. So yeah, hundred centimeters per meter. Max distances, reverb, whatever, 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 whatever. Okay. Yeah, so the main thing here is first person game mode. I'm gonna click on the magnifying glass and that will select it right here. Cool. Double click on that, and you'll see that this game mode here sets the defaults for the game. So the game session, the game state, the player controller, the player state, the HUD class, 
all this stuff. And so if you want to add things to the HUD, which is a lecture we'll do in the future, if you want to have health bars and decorations and dialogues and things like that, this is the class that controls the heads up display for the player in the game. And this is the person. The person is a first person character. That's why all that work we've been doing inside of the first person character blueprint works <laughs> because it's set as the player. And, it, and it's set so that when you enter the game, you, the player possesses the pawn and, and controls it. And so all that's set up for you automatically when you do a, a template. So you don't have to set all these really basic things to begin with. But this is where it's all like located. Uh, the player controller is here under player controller. So if we browse to that, uh, ooh, it might be in C++ actually. Um, so we might not be able to edit that. Um, but yeah, the um, this is like where your basic settings are. So you go to world settings and then you can find the game mode. The game mode holds really the world settings. And that sets up the first person character as the main thing for the first person character. Okay, um, yeah, so this is how you make a projectile. Uh, we did hit scan, and so let's do, let's do, let's go back into the other project. Do I want to save this? Probably not, maybe. Yeah, sure, why not? Save all. You can hit the button here, I guess. Um, let's go back into spring. And, um, any questions about that, by the way, guys? So I just talked about a few different things. Um, the settings, key binds. Um, it's kind of like how you, because right now I've been talking about a bunch of different things, but I, I kind of want to get you guys into a place where you can start actually building a game. You know what I mean? Start actually like doing stuff. Like how do you have people die? And you know, how do you, how do you have a door open when you walk up to it? So let's, let's, let's maybe do that. I think, I think that's actually what it, really kind of wanted to get at today, um, which is um, making a door. And so last time we talked about hit scan, we've got projectiles. So now let's make it so that um, maybe there's a door here and when you walk up to it, the door moves down. You guys understand? So like touch and think, right? So with the sentry gun before I had think, every frame it was rotating and it would look to see if the player was, a, was ahead of it, right? That's think. Touch is either you collide with it, like uh, what we had up here with uh, Cherry, right? You touch it and then it would yell halt, right? Or you can make it so that when you come close to something, like we have our sphere collision here, and when you come close to it, the snowman says hello to you, okay? So what we want is a maybe a sphere collision, maybe a box collision, probably a box collision, and a door. And so when you walk up to the door, the door opens, and you walk through, and then the door closes, okay? So let's start off by searching for a box trigger. A box trigger is a uh, invisible box that you can put in the world. And we'll scale it out like this. And we'll scale it up like this. And we'll scale it out a fair bit. So like when a person walks within that, yeah, seems fine. So when a person walks within that zone, the door will open. You guys understand? And this is very common in video games. You don't even, you don't even see it. You're just walking up. It's invisible. You walk up, the door opens. You know, you don't even pay attention to it in most games. It is a big box, but but I want it starting to open like here probably because that's already pretty close to the door. You know what I mean? So you walk up here and then it opens. I don't really want it to open on the side of the door. So I'm going to turn this thing into a blueprint. So I'm going to, while the box trigger is selected, I'm going to click on blueprint and I will make this a, a blueprint name will be door opening or door, door, door opening, door opener, door opening thing. Doesn't really matter. Okay. So we're going to select that. And then we're going to add a component to it that will be the door. So we'll add a uh, box or something, or a, uh, hmm, that, and then we can see where the box trigger is. Um, I think this is going to be floating in air though, so let's snap it off to the side here. So you can actually see what it looks like in the world here. So I'm going to drop this down to right there, 
and I am going to widen the door, scale it up, and move it up. Yeah, it's probably a little bit too big now. Scale it down a little bit. Something like that, maybe. Still a little bit above the ground. widen it a little bit so it blocks the uh, so I have the blueprint here and I'm adding I'm adding a component to the blueprint but I have the I, but I've got the world open over here so I can actually see what it looks like in the world at the same time um, okay <clears throat> and I can add a material to it I guess I don't really care all right so what I want is I want for this thing to say, eh, let's make this collision component. Um, yeah, it's fine. Okay, uh, it doesn't matter. We're not gonna be in the air anyway. Okay, so we got that. Okay, so now we want the event graph and the event graph will say when, uh, hmm, yeah, so when the uh, get, get location, um, hmm, cube, get location, get world location, get absolute location, get relative location. Mm, good question. Let's do a relative location. So this is going to be the relative location of it to its parent. So what does that mean? So when you have things that are parented to each other, when the parent moves, the child moves at the same time. That's, uh, again, something that makes sense from linear algebra. When you have a, uh, a transform that applies all the subsequent transforms get that transform as well. So anytime I move the parent here, the cube will, will move with it. <clears throat> so if I'm out here in the world and I move the, uh, the box trigger, the box moves around with it because the, the door is set to be a child of the uh, box trigger. Snap it down. There we go. And so, as the parent moves, the child moves as well. It's kind of like if you move your, your shoulder, the elbow moves too. And as your elbow moves, your hand moves too. And if I move my elbow, my hand moves, my shoulder doesn't move, right? And if I move my wrist, the fingers move, but not the elbow, right? So these are all parented. The, the parent of the finger is the wrist, and the wrist to the elbow, and the elbow to the shoulder, and the shoulder to the uh, top of the neck, and the, you know, and then the upper torso is connected to the lower torso, and so on and so forth. So that's called parenting. And so what I want to do is get the offset of me, the door to my parent, which is the box trigger. And so whatever that is, I'm just gonna save that. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna promote that result to a variable and uh, I'm just gonna save that when the thing is created. So when the thing's created, whatever that value is, I don't really care, that's our default. And um, I'm just gonna save that into a variable called um, starting location, okay. And so that if I ever need to reset the door back to where it started, you remember how Cherry was kind of vibrating up and down in place? A better way of doing that would have been to save its starting location and then every frame move upwards. And then when it hits a maximum height, switch that direction to negative and have it move downwards. And then when it hits a negative height, switch the direction upwards. And then it would be a lot better than that weird jerking thing. So what I'm doing here is I'm just going to save the location of the, of the door relative to the box trigger. And then what I'm going to do here is say when somebody begins overlapping me, I'm going to start off by saying print string. Uh, hello, fine. Come in here, hit play, just to verify that everything's set, set up right. Because sometimes it's not set up right. And if I walk in here, uh, it says hello. Okay. Now the 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 door is not visible, and the reason for that is because box triggers are invisible. So um, we need to uh, fix that. Uh, Lighting visible, it's set to be visible. Uh, you do, 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 set to be also visible. Let's see if I can walk through that. Yeah, so there's an invisible wall there, All right? So let's see, some physics, visible, actor hidden, in game, off. Uh, 
And there we go. Okay. So, uh, so what you want is the box trigger to be invisible and the box to be visible. Um, I just made them both visible for now so we can see what's going on because we're basically out of time. But I'm, I'm going to eat up a little bit more of your time if you don't mind. And so right now if I walk over it, it just says hello. But what I want is for that door to... Um, I, I could just make it vanish, I guess. That would be quite, quite simple. Um, I could grab the cube and, I don't know, like, delete. <laughs> delete it. It's the world's simplest door. So when somebody overlaps the uh, when somebody overlaps the door, the door vanishes. It explodes. There we go. And da, 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 da. there we go. There's no door anymore. <laughs> I'm the juggernaut. <laughs> so it's, a, it, it's four o'clock. We're done. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna do a little bit more than that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna um we're gonna move. Uh, we're gonna you collide with it if you go to the side of it. Uh, the, wherever the box trigger is, when you overlap that, it, d it destroys the cube component here. So what I actually want to do is I want to I want to move the cube out of the way. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a timeline. Uh, timeline, add timeline, and this will be called door timeline door open. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say when they begin overlapping the door, it's going to play the timeline, and the timeline is going to move the door out of the way. And I'm also going to add an event called end overlap, a event actor end overlap. And what I want is for the door to come back up when they leave. And so I'm going to say when they leave the box trigger, it's going to reverse automatically. And so when you walk up, the door will move out of the way, and when you leave, the door will come back up. So uh, how do we how do we do that? So what we're going to do is we are going to double click on the timeline, and you can see that there is a thing, and we're going to add a float track. And so the float track is going to be the offset of the door, and I don't know how big this should be. Um, so we will add a keyframe at. There. Time zero, it'll be at float zero. And so we want it to go from, I don't know, how long do you guys want a door to open? How long do you think a door should open? Should take to open? Three seconds, okay. So we're gonna add another keyframe, uh, way over here at three seconds, down here at negative one. And so I'm just gonna right click on that, add a key to curve float there. So at time, I'm just gonna set it exactly to three seconds to negative one. Okay, and that is that. Use the last keyframe auto play loop. Don't we don't know? No, no, no. Uh, auto play. Hmm. I don't think we want it to auto play. Compile and. Yeah, it looks good. So, what's going to happen is every time this timeline is running, it's going to send out a tick. It's like a, it's like event tick. And so, what we're going to do is we're going to set the relative offset. Uh, set the relative location, set actor relative location, probably uh, let's do this, set relative location, uh, we're going to set the relative location of the door to be that, oh no, let's give it a name, uh, new track zero, rename to be displacement, I'll save and come back into door opening thing here. Okay, so uh, what's going to happen is that this thing's going to tick over and over again. Every frame it's going to tick and it's going to return a number from zero to negative one. And, it, and, and it's going to go uh, until the thing's finished moving. And so I'm going to take this uh, number and I'm going to multiply it by whatever I think the height of the thing is. Uh, how many meters tall is that? It looks like you know, three meters tall. So I'm gonna multiply it by um, a float. I'm gonna multiply it by, mm, rather than guessing. Mm, yeah, I'll just guess. Uh, I'll multiply it by 300. So that's gonna give us a number from 
uh, 0 to negative 300. And I'm going to split this open here, and I'm just going to fit that into there. And so the Z, the, the Z is up and down. And so the Z offset of the door is going to go from 0, 0, 0 over 3 seconds to negative 300. So it's going to move down 3 meters if I did this correctly, which is always up in the air. I haven't worked with timelines since last semester. So if I walk up here and hit that, nothing happens. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Oh, didn't move down far enough. And then when I leave, uh, the door should go back up. There we go. Okay. So walk forward. There we go. <laughs> so that's why I want this to be a variable here. Uh, right click, promote to variable, uh, call it door height. And that compile, I guess we'll set that to 3000. Save. That should make it move rather quickly. All right, so if I walk up here, it will loop, go down. I walk through. Loop. <laughs> right. So it's actually passing through the floor. <laughs> right? Normally, normally you wouldn't see the fact the door is just moving through the floor, but. Yeah. There you go. And there you go. So you got a door. Walk forward, whoop, walk out, and the door will come back. Pretty cool, huh? So uh, that, yeah, and, and uh, or you can have it rotate. Uh, that's another option you could do. Um, uh, rather than having it rotate that way, I could set the relative location or the relative rotation. Set relative rotation. Set actor relative rotation. Nope, nope, nope. Right click, set relative. And again, this is relative to the box trigger. So relative rotation. So rather than moving it, we could have it rotate instead. And so it will split pin. So we want it to roll pitch yaw. We want it to yaw. And we want it to be we want it to go, let's say we want to do 180. Yeah, so let's multiply it by 180, float times float. So we want to multiply it, so it'll 90? No, we want it to do 90 degrees. So we'll swing it over 90 degrees over three seconds. And so we will send the output of that into, yeah. Okay. Compile, save, <clears throat> play. Walk forward, you can see the door swings open. Right? You walk away, door swings closed. Kind of cool, huh? Kind of neat. So, let's walk forward like that, and then we walk away, the door swings back shut. And it will push us. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Okay. So that'll be, uh, can it push you while it swings it? Maybe, I don't know. Players are weird. Players players don't interact very nicely with the physics engine. And so you can see here, it's like, I guess maybe it was pushing me. Oh, it's, it's rotating the box trigger too, look at that. Should not be doing that. It should be doing a relative. Uh, oh, it's rotating self. That's why. <clears throat> that that rotates the whole actor, right? I just want to rotate the. Uh, I just want to rotate the component. Um, set relative rotation. Split that. And yaw. And update. And hell, we can do both if we want. So we can move down and rotate at the same time. That'd be kind of cool. That'd be interesting. All right. So come in here. And now you'll see that the box isn't moving. Just the thing is. So the door rotates and spins at the same time. Just kind of cool. Kind of a neat look.
um, that's that's our class for today. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> uh, the lesson of the story here is touch, right? And so the the ways we interact with the world are trace line to to see what we're looking at, to see what our gunshot, and when we hit an E button, what we're using. <clears throat> think, touch, think, touch, think, and trace. T T T. Right. So we can either trace line to see what's in front of us. We can think and check in front of us. Oh, there's a pedestrian in front of us. Honk, you know, whatever. <clears throat> Dive out of the way, whatever. Or touch. And touch can either be physical collision, which is event hit, <clears throat> or it can be overlap, in which case you create these box triggers. And when you intersect, when you overlap the box trigger, it starts an event. So your assignment for Tuesday is to make a door. It's a very common thing in video games. You're going to make a, a you're going to make a invisible, you know, sphere or box collision, box trigger, and then you're going to make it so that when you walk over it, the door swings open or moves down or turns invisible or, or something. Well, invisible is not good, but some way of walking through a door. Okay. Uh, cyberpunk is that cyberpunk? <laughs> that looks like cyberpunk. Yeah. So. Yeah, so Cyberpunk, when, when there's no, uh, when they lose an animation, like they don't have a climb down the ladder animation, uh, it defaults to T-posing. <clears throat> so clearly that actor did not have a climbing uh, animation set properly on it, and so it T-poses all the way down. And uh, uh, Johnny Silverhand T-poses in the final battle as well. Okay, so that's, that's your assignment for Tuesday. Um, make a door. You guys cool with that? <clears throat> you want me to post mine so you can copy it? Uh, let me zoom in a little bit. Let's see. Get a little more visible for you guys. Ada, I made a door. Do you like doors? Okay. Yeah. What do you like more, doors or rooms? Hmm. Rooms. I like rooms more. But how do how can you? <laughs> my daughter's laughing at the cyberpunk. Yeah. Yeah, it do be like that sometimes. Oh, I want to see that. Do be like that sometimes. So, uh, yeah, that uh, we'll we'll talk more about animations in a little bit. Animations are fun, but this is a simple way of doing an animation. You create a timeline, you double click on the timeline, and you add keyframes to it. And uh, length of three seconds there. That's an important thing. Uh, and so, Ada, check out the door that I made here. So when I walk up, the door uh, rotates out of the way. When I walk it out of the way, it just fell through the world. It did, and then it comes back up. Like that. Cool. Yep. So it's a door. Would you like to learn how to make a door? No. No, okay, just use daddy's door. Yep. And so again, you just make a timeline. You can just right click and add, there's, you can also add uh, keyframes at other places, but basically at time zero, zero, at time zero, the displacement is zero. And then I, I usually have my timelines go from zero to one or zero to negative one, uh, rather than hard coding in the size of the door into the timeline, because it's kind of annoying to drag those things around. So what I do instead <clears throat> is every frame, it will just give a number from zero to one. And then I scale that based on like some variable like door height or something like that. And then that will allow me to fine tune it a little bit easier. And then you do things like set location, set the rotation to move the door out of the way or to rotate it. Okay. And I guess I didn't use this, did I? So I guess I could delete this too. I guess I'm not even delete I'm not even using that. <clears throat> so we'll just get rid of that and make it even simpler for you. you know, no begin play. Uh, it is nice usually to save those things just in case you need to um, reset for some reason. If something gets screwed up, you can always just go back to the beginning. But yeah. can you play Skyrim? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll join you in a second. I'm just going to send this update to my students, and then we are done. Door opener. All right, guys, uh, any questions? That is that.
So that'll be your assignment for Tuesday. Just make a door. It's a very common thing in video games. All right, y'all. I will see you later.